court effectively outlawed the use of race in college admissions. Now what? Does race conscious college admissions even matter anyway? I mean, does it really benefit us? And if these people are doing all of this, what's next? Are we about to lose all the DEI stuff we done got over the last couple of years? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're talking about it after the break. Brokers, welcome to another episode of Brokers, where we talk about the unbelievable ish this country has done to keep us broke. Now, here are your hosts, Amber and Erica. Hey, everybody, I'm Amber. And I'm Erica. And today on Brokish, we are unpacking the students for fair admissions versus Harvard University and University of North Carolina, the affirmative action case that was just decided. See, you starting already, it. Amber. I'm starting y'all already. Let, y'all, let me tell y'all. So I just want you to know how things go here in Brokish work. Nine times out of 10, Erica is the person that puts the scripts together for the most part, the questions, finds the guests, you know, does all of the background production heavy lifting work. Okay. But today, since Amber is effectively our guest, I was like, hey, Amber, do the scripts. Okay. I'm thinking this is great. Amber has sent me 80 million pages of a script. And I feel like she's about to inundate us in all of this legalese and all of this stuff. She's always like the American blah, blah, blah of Harvard University and the universe. Like, that's we the, don't that's need the, all of that. That's the name of the case. That's the name of the case. I know that's the name that's of the case. It's the name of the case. I understand that. It's the name of the case. So I'm just, I'm just I'm telling the people the name of the case. That's I know that. And the people know that. And the people are like, we want to talk about affirmative action, but we don't want to be bored. So I'm just asking you know, if maybe as we go through this, you could talk about affirmative action and not like bore us, because I think it's a really interesting topic. I wanted to talk about it. I'm glad we're here. Let's not bore the people. So I'm saying. You know what? This is this is why we have a dysfunctional relationship. OK, because if she just wanted to get on here and pat herself in the back because we on episode four and she done wrote two scripts and I done wrote one. I mean, she could have just said that. that that's less words than don't say the name of the whole case that the episode is about. That's why you cannot be cool with every single person that said they down for the cause. OK, so anyway, y'all. We are talking about affirmative action. And yes, I sent her a long script because I am about to say this. That opinion was 257 pages. And I love y'all. And I read every single one of them for the last two weeks. And you know what, Amber? Strong Jay. Strong Jay. <laughs> we are very, very <laughs> grateful to you for doing that work. And you, you kind of... I feel like you're real amped up right now. So let's just bring it back down. So just tell the brokers what you've been doing. Um, Maybe, and this will calm you before we get into the affirmative action talk. So Erica gaslighting me is a perfect segue into really what this episode (laughs) is about. (laughs) Because actually this opinion is a great little micro lesson in everything that's wrong with America. Like the way these six white people, and I'm including Clarence Thomas in that because, you know, whatever, um, really just like gaslight the rest of us in like 180 pages is just wild to me. So yes, we are talking about affirmative action, but hopefully over the next however long we talk, what we really are going to unpack is all of the things that happen in a society when you build it on fundamental inequity and systemic racism. Because That's basically what this opinion is about. So anyway, Erica, how you doing? I'm good, Amber. And I just, first of all, brokers, y'all may not know this. And the fact that y'all don't know this might kind of make my, like, might hurt my feelings. But for every episode, we have a song. And then this song for this episode is Lights, Camera, Action by Mr. Cheeks, which I, Amber, when I, I was like, I was like, okay, yes. And anyway, I, t- I went back down memory lane and that song and I was like getting very excited about it. But that's not what I've been up to. But I was I was dancing in my kitchen behind that one. Was you dancing like people dance before they saved or what you was just doing now? Like what people do after they get saved? I'm just- I believe in a big God. So I dance <laughs> the same. 
I, I don't know about you though. But, you know. Oh, anyway, I definitely have a pre-Jesus dance. I'm not gonna lie. See, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what you been doing? But I, I went to my first academic conference, Amber. Yes. How was yes. it? Got to nerd out. It was great. I got to do a presentation. So I got to get over my initial just fear of presenting feelings of inadequacy, you know, imposter syndrome, all that kind of stuff. So I'm working through that. Wait, tell that everybody what your presentation was about. Oh, what was my presentation about? It was about financial miseducation in Black podcast culture. I so, wonder where she got that idea from. Guys. Not brokeish because we don't believe in financial miseducation over here. So no, not and that's what I'm saying. Like yes. yes, but I just want to be clear. It was not. Yes, that's not where the idea came from. But yes, yeah, so it was great. I met lots of really great people. I also met some people that were creeps. So that's just life. Um, not going to talk about the creeps. I'm going to focus on the nice people. So we have these study groups on Zoom. And you see, I see these people all the time and we're working together and we're on Zoom. So I've never met them, right? So over the course of the past year, it's just like, hey, so-and-so, what are you working on? And y'all set a timer and then you go back after a certain amount of time and check in. How far did you get to them? And then to just to be able to put my hands on them it was great because for me, they're like a community through this journey. So I, and you know, I love community. So it's so beautiful to see those lovely people from the Zoom room. I met a new friend from the UK who I have converted into a broker, which is very exciting for us. Um, coincidentally, he also has a new podcast. So you should go check that out. It's called Make It Plain. Love and it. yes, and he hates being a public intellectual, but he is. And he talks to other public intellectuals about things. So that is exciting. So I got to meet some of the giants in the field and have cocktails on patios life is good you know it's it's giving david roughing and the temptations like it's it's giving what the <laughs> temptations i mean you know i'm over here feeling real like otis like ain't nobody <laughs> i'm just playing <laughs> i'm playing <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, that's awesome. No, seriously. I'm, I, I told you this privately and I will tell you publicly. I think it's amazing to see people that you care about doing things that are aligned with who they are, their purpose. And it's not just productive, but it's joyful. And so I'm very happy for you. And I mean that from my heart. Thank you. I, and welcome. I don't think that's shade. And one other thing, <laughs> Amber, we got to ask the brokers about this. So one of the one of the brokers who I actually know from like Black Power Media and the Remix Morning Show chat, um, and I love her. And she like retweets all of our stuff. She engages with our content. She's always super kind and sends me stories. And so I love her. But she sent us a tweet and she's like, Brokish is a thoughtful podcast, which is great, but she spells it T-H-O-T. And so for those who don't know T-H-O-T, that whole over there is like, you know, thought. So my question is for the person who did that, I'm going to let her rena remain nameless, but who is the thought? <laughs> and Brokish, is it Amber or is it me? Because I'm betting it's Amber. I was I'm about to say, me. tell them what your answer was in private before we got on this internet. <laughs> Because the, the, what she said was the comment was about me. <laughs> she said, I'm I thoughtful. I, I okay, but speaking of thoughtful, because maybe I am. Because let me just show you some real fast. My show is pro ho. So, I mean. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, maybe it is me after all. That's what we're wearing in the pickup line, huh? I mean. <laughs> Costco and everything. Well, you know. Uh, I think ho is a social construct, like everything agreed, else. So, I mean, agreed. you know, I'm also pro ho. Agreed. So, so anyway. okay, Amber, either one of us could have been thoughts then and broke the thoughtful <laughs> We need to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I think we should. I, I'm okay. not opposed. So, anyway. Let's thoughtfully talk about affirmative action, Amber. So... I just want to start by letting everybody know that what we finna do here today is exhibit A, 
why you need to be paying attention to everything that is happening around you. Because when they say one thing is happening, what's really happening is like 50 things. OK, so we just everybody know what affirmative action is in some way. You know, it's basically an opportunity to try to catch up and fix or remediate past discrimination started with John Kennedy signing an executive order instructing the government to take affirmative action to basically not be racist against black and minority contractors. Like let's do a better job of hiring them. And it took the government 10 years to get that right. Okay. Cause after Kennedy did it, Johnson did a little bit with it. And even Nixon, believe it or not. Um, and the byproduct of all of that ended up being that the affirmative action program was wildly beneficial for white women contractors who were working with the government. <laughs> Shocker. Shock and awe. Shocker, right? So we have a program that's set up to redress what I assume is a racial wrong. Yes, and it because it, it comes on the heels. Well, it came right before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But then after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, another executive order was signed, basically putting a little more teeth on the original one that Kennedy signed. So, yes, this was really about racism at first. OK. Yes. And then, of course, uh, by 1971, the affirmative action is expressly extended to include women. And then the data we have in the 10 years after that is that affirmative action was wildly beneficial for white women. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then, of course, you know, like everything in capitalist countries, um, affirmative action takes root and it becomes good for corporate bottom lines. And so you have corporations, you have colleges, you have all types of institutions uh, setting up their version of affirmative action, right? Because they are deciding that diversity is now beneficial to them in some way. And for most people, that has to do with government contracting, right? So if you do business with the government, one of the byproducts of the affirmative action executive orders was that the government was going to start evaluating the racial makeup of its contractors and giving that preferential treatment to contractors that had diverse uh, workforces and diverse leadership. So of course that trickles down to corporate America because ain't no easier money to get than the government money, right? Well, I don't know if it's easy to get, like there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of bureaucracy, but once you, once you get past the paperwork, then that's what that's the part that can be very easy because as somebody who works for an 8A firm and that's like one of the programs that the government sets aside mm -hmm. they, like the amount of paperwork to be able to get the 8A certification to establish yourself as a black owned business for government contract it's massive you have to tell them everything so yeah um but once you're in you're in yes Yes. And so one of the places where this becomes a hotbed is in colleges. So around the 70s, you have colleges starting to do like hard quotas and hard set asides where we are designating this many seats for minority, which I actually hate that term. It really should be majority because we are the majority, but BIPOC people. OK, black and brown. You people. said you said BIPOC and as like to replace minority and that's better. I hate that more. Do you really? Yeah, I mean, BIPOC is terrible. Well, at least it's not a lie because we ain't even minorities. We are the global majority. But anyway, okay, whatever, black and brown people, okay? Um, Which I and also don't like. <laughs> it's fine. Can we just say who we mean? Because, and we'll talk about this later, when we're talking about brown people, there are some brown people who didn't didn't really feel affirmative action. Well, that's true. But when I say brown people, I'm talking about indigenous and Hispanic people. So that's who I'm talking about. But you're right. You're right. So one of the first places where this is challenged is in University of California. And we have a, a white man named Alan Baki who applies to medical school twice at UC Davis and he does not get in. And when he inquires, what he learns is that there are 100 seats for admissions at UC Davis. And 16 of those seats are set aside for um, black and brown people, minorities. And when he found out that on average with the mean scores of those 16 people were lower than his scores, he decided to sue 
say he was discriminated against. What did you want that white man to do? Did you just want him to ignore the fact that he applied twice and didn't get in? I mean, there is a song called Accept What God Allows, but we can move on. He sued. Okay, he could have accepted what God allowed, but he did. He decided not to. And the case eventually made its way to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court said in that decision was that, okay, you can consider diversity. Diversity is a good thing. But what you cannot do is have hard quotas. You can't just be out here setting aside spots, designating because they say, oh, well, that violates the 14th Amendment. Now, <clears throat> OK, we'll talk about that later. But they do say you can consider the race. You can do that. And so we have an evolution of cases that come after it. Gruder versus Bollinger was the last one in 2003 where the court reaffirmed that you can consider race. You can, as long as you ain't doing no hard quotas and no hard set asides, you can consider it. Well, y'all remember our friend Abby Fisher? Oh, can I make a can I make a side note, please? Yes. Okay. So I do want, and I don't think this is a disclosure. And I've talked about this before on the show, but I do want to just mention this as it relates to affirmative action. So I went to school on what would be considered an affirmative action scholarship, right? So there was this program that was set aside specifically for Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic students to go to the University of Texas at Austin. They had two tiers of it. And so one tier had a higher scholarship amount than the other. And it paid over the course of five years for you to be able to have your study. And during my tenure, which was in the 1990s, <laughs> Anyway, during my tenure there in the 90s, <laughs> actually, all of that affirmative, those scholarships were actually taken away. And so students who entered, I think as like within three years of me coming to the school or going to the school were no longer eligible. And a lot of people talk about like affirmative action and they're always talking about this notion of, you know, you're getting something you don't deserve. And quite frankly, I think black people need to get things they don't deserve. Like, um, but I think we deserve everything. But I don't care which GPA was. I don't care what it was. I think you probably did deserve it. Like, I don't even want to talk about that. But all the people in this program, you know, especially on the higher tier, right? These are all people in like the top 5% of their class. These are all people with all the best grades and all the best credentials and all the best things. And so to sort of go to school and have that cloud over you, like you're here just because when it's like, well, actually I'm not, but even if I were, I should be because I deserve all the things. But anyway, I just want to point out that I think I owe, and I don't, I don't think this is too bold a statement that the success that I and my husband have uh, have that a lot of that comes from the fact that the state allotted this money and gave this to us and we were able to start our lives without student loan debt we were able to start our lives you know in a place that was much better than a lot of other people and so it's easy to talk like, so for me, affirmative action is a very personal thing. My sister also went to school on affirmative action scholarship. It's a very personal thing and I can see how beneficial it is. And so that's why this conversation for me is also just heart wrenching and terrible because I think about all the people not too long after me who they were like, nope, here comes the rug and we're pulling it from underneath you. Anyway, you were talking about Abby, that bitch Abby, Went yes, to and that, and actually, to, go to the University of Texas at Austin. That, that's a great point to bring up because let's talk about what affirmative action is and what it is not before we talk about mediocre Abby. Okay. What affirmative action has always been, and you can see that in the language of the executive order, is to take affirmative action to bring people in. It has never been take affirmative action to give things to people who don't deserve it and who are otherwise not qualified. And that was the same thing that was true in the government contracting. It was not that these black business owners were people who were contracted at a subpar level. It's not that their product or their services were inferior to their white counterparts. They had just been systematically and summarily excluded from the opportunity and precluded from even having a chance to get the opportunity to demonstrate that they could do the same thing their counterparts were doing. So the whole point Absolutely. of affirmative action 
was to take affirmative action to tear down the barriers that have been excluding people who could stand on their own two feet in the spaces that they were being invited. And so part of the marketing campaign of white supremacy is to make affirmative action about giving things to people that they don't deserve. And I just want to say crazy. factually and historically, that is not the record. And even what you described, the state allotting money for people who have been historically underrepresented at a state university that they and their parents and their foremothers and forefathers have paid taxes to build, that is not giving something to people that do not deserve it or who cannot succeed there. That is recognizing that there have been historic barriers for people who always ought to have had these opportunities. So as and whose parents went to segregated school, like, I mean, all these things, right? <laughs> so yes. Anyway. So as we talk about people like mediocre bitter abby let's just be clear about what we're talking about and so the reason why we talk about abby fisher is because she actually founded the organization that ultimately filed this lawsuit along with edward bloom so when she was denied admission to the university of texas with her <coughs> 3.5 <at> <coughs> 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 and her you know mediocre how could she even show up with a 3.5 and, and think she could get in like at a state school girl. that says that the top 10% is automatically admitted, like, girl, that's just mad. That's no, just Texas mad. doesn't even, te University of Texas doesn't even, doesn't even offer the top 10% admission like the other state schools do. It is something like the top 6%. In yeah, it's even, it's even like, less. It's even less now. Because, they call it the Harvard of the South. Bitch, are you crazy? Right, right. Anyway, I'm sorry. So Abby didn't get in, and Abby you know, instead of accepting what God allowed uh, her and Alan Bach, you know, must be cousins somewhere down the line, she sued. And in two cases, Fisher one and Fisher two, the Supreme Court again upheld race as a permissible basis. Again, saying there were two things. One, these programs eventually have to have an end. And we're going to talk about that later. And two, as long as we're not using hard quotas and hard set asides. Um, it's all good. We're all good. Abby didn't accept that. And, and for the last 15 or so years, and I will say this is true for all or most social justice Supreme Court cases. These are suits that are built by lawyers. Brown versus Board of Education was built. It was a case constructed by civil rights lawyers. So a lot of these cases are constructed on purpose with the express design to get rulings that are ultimately in line with what they hope to accomplish. So you know, you have Harvard, you have UNC, two flagship universities, and they are essentially using race in similar ways. So they are trying to create a diverse student body. People get scores. And part of what is included in that score they get is race. So they have a they have a rating system that they're creating for the students to help determine their eligibility for admittance. Yes. And I, and I will tell you again, just like everything in capitalism, what God, what we mean for good, the devil uses for evil. So Harvard particularly had a real problematic ass system. Now we just going to keep it honest. And it was particularly problematic with regard to Asian applicants and Asian American applicants because it was a personality rating. And it was a rating that rated a whole bunch of subjective stuff like, are you likable? Do you have courage? Do you have kindness? They and rate the people on that. Yes, but but more importantly, um, what eighteen year old like how you how you rate an eighteen year old on all of that anyway? But but anyway, Harvard did its own internal investigation uh, ten years ago, where they themselves found that this whole personality rating was disproportionately biased towards Asian American and Asian applicants, and they did not do nothing about it. Uh, they didn't tell anybody either. These documents came out in discovery. So um, they they have known for some time that the way they use this personality rating is disproportionately harmful to Asian students. Yikes. But what Harvard's contention was, was, I mean, basically, it don't matter because they have the highest Admission overall rating. raw data scores, like their test scores mm -hmm. and their GPA scores are 
higher than every other demographic that applies. So basically Harvard's position was we're going to charge into the game. Well, <laughs> no, that's not quite how it works. But anyway, that was part of the problem with this. And so one of the things that the Supreme Court took up was, OK, not only can you use race, but even if you can use race, can you use it in a way where you're just assigning a score to somebody based on their race? And so we all know what the answer is, but really this ain't even about the answer because we all knew with the people who occupy the court right now, we knew what the answer was going to be. I want to spend this time talking about why this answer is a long ass gaslight and why this answer is problematic. So one of the things that the court said was that one of the reasons we are rejecting- Amber, I'm sorry, before we do that, do you do you know anything about Bloom? Are there just any details you can give us about him and his background yeah. real so quick? If you Edward, have Edward Bloom is a member of the Federalist Society, which is basically the bastion of conservative ideology here in America. Um, it is almost every Republican appointed member of the Supreme Court is affiliated with the Federalist Society in some way. I mean, it is it is the the hilltop of conservative ideology. So he is a um, multimillionaire member of the conservative Federalist Society that has for years been pumping money into politics through lobbying, um, through proposed legislation, he has spent quite a bit of money, millions of dollars over the years, helping to draft proposed le uh, legislation across the country on the federal and the state level. And for the last few years, he's focused his attention on crafting lawsuits designed to get Supreme Court rulings that basically outlaw the consideration of race or the recognition that we have to have racial remediation in America. He wants that completely undone. So not much is known about him. And most of the people who pump money into our politics are the same way. They hide their hand and throw their rocks on purpose. So this is actually the most publicity he's gotten out of any of the cases he's done. So we don't know a whole lot about him other than he basically uses the Federalist Society to pump his money into Republican causes. So. Well, you know, we're not going to make this necessarily. Anyway, keep going. I was going to say something. It's not important. Keep going. So anyway, yeah, I, I agree. I think I know where you were going about Republicans because because all of them ain't shit. I agree. But they are the worst. So one of the things that makes this opinion so problematic is that the court says we are going to find that race is an impermissible thing to consider in college admissions because race is too flimsy of a concept for you. Oh, now we don't know what it is? And that's why I'm like, y'all are really gaslighting people. Y'all invented this shit. Like y'all, race was literally constructed hmm. to do exactly what these people are doing, except it, they were doing it in a negative way. And so for the people who constructed race to look at everybody else and say, well, race is too flimsy to use in considering whether somebody is qualified to go to college. Like that is wild to me. That is wild. Amber, as a black woman, I feel like race is the opposite of whatever flimsy is. Like, <laughs> like strong as hell. Like I feel it and it don't feel flimsy. Like the material is strong. <laughs> so I, are they using flimsy in terms of defining what race is that notion is flimsy yeah so one of the things they said is like for example and and this is part of why having good lawyers matter so one of the questions oh that came this up, is the plug and for you <laughs> you accept to work on the side with i'm good but one of the questions that came up is well which category would a middle eastern person fall into and the lawyers for unc admitted they didn't know whether they will fall into the category for Asian, whether they will fall into the category as African American, literally, depending on like a, a Middle Eastern person from North Africa, because you know they don't claim the continent. Um, so, like, why you gotta be messy? I, I'm just not even talking about that. 
So like what would, would one of the questions that was a question actually during the oral argument, like if you had a student from Egypt who was from North Africa, would that student be considered on the racial boxes to be Asian or would that student be considered to be African-American? And the lawyers admitted they didn't know. And that was something that the court really was bothered by and um, but i have a i have a real hard time with this because i swear in the wild people know niggas i swear they do i swear <laughs> in the wild they know exactly who they are and we <laughs> also know that these programs were not created to remediate historical discriminations against folks from jordan and egypt we also know that the people who are usually uh the difficulty categorizing those people, those are not the people who are most likely subject to the systemic inequities that are at play in college admissions. So it's it's a red herring from the from the break. But I, I just wanna I wanna read this quote because I want y'all to see how how comfortable these folks are gaslighting us. Okay. Um, in the in the majority opinion, the court wrote, for starters, the categories are themselves imprecise in many ways. Some of them are plainly overbroad. By grouping together all Asian students, for instance, respondents are apparently uninterested in whether South Asian or East Asian students are adequately represented, so long as there is enough of one to compensate for a lack of the other. Meanwhile, other racial categories such as Hispanic are arbitrary or undefined. Can you, can you tell me how insane it is for the people who invented erasure to use the concern of erasure to justify overturning programs designed to undo what they did. Like I'm telling you, it's it's crazy. Cause because we've been saying this. Like y'all literally made this shit up to hoard power, to oppress people, and to push through in getting what you wanted off the backs of other people. Like you literally cre y'all created it. White was created to do this very thing. And you have had black people and indigenous people and brown people talking about why race as a construct is problematic because it erases people's identities. And y'all have said, what are you talking about? And then you turn around and you co-opt that argument and you use it to undermine programs that allow students who are the victims of the very thing you did to go to college. That's crazy to me. Well, I just don't understand how we can act like the genie is not already out of the bottle. Like, even if all the things are true about how imprecise, how this or that, like, that does not change the fact that the material conditions of people are greatly affected by the race that they fall into. And I'm like, this feels very much like that, you know, that notion of porn when they're like, oh, you just know it when you see it. Y'all know Y'all know what people are when y'all see them. Like, y'all exactly know right. what it is. And I mean, this is not like a, a phenotype discussion, right? But you, y'all know. Like, let's not act like we don't know what's what. And you can't have it both ways, okay? It's imprecise because that's how it was made. That's how it was made because it never made any sense to be the basis of categorizing people and putting them into hierarchies so some people could benefit and other people will be oppressed for the benefit of those people, like it never made any sense. So it's, it's always been that way. And so for, for us to decide now that race is just too imprecise to try to fix what has been broken is just a, a wild concept. And and, and it's, it's a, sorry. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, and it's especially a wild concept from somebody like Clarence. When Clarence got his job, how did Clarence get his job, Amber? How did Before he, he even got his job, how he, he got to yell on the same kind of program you was on. That man went to Holy Cross College and then got to Yale Law School because, again, people were affirmatively out here deciding to look for people who would otherwise never get this opportunity, like Negroes named Clarence from Georgia who went to Holy Cross College. Okay, But I'm saying, how did he specifically get his job? Like, what kind of person were they looking for when Clarence got his job? A Negro to replace Thurgood Marshall. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Clarence. <laughs> Clarence, you and Jenny over there. <laughs> and, 
And I also want to say that the sec, well, I don't even know if this is first or second, but they also start with the premise that the constitution is colorblind. Oh and, shit. And and I and I bring that up just because again, that's why I say everything that's wrong with our country, you can glean from this opinion. And I want to talk about not only how logically flawed that is, but just how deeply problematic it is to start from a premise that a document that called black people three-fifths persons to, to call that document colorblind is is not only factually inaccurate. But it requires the type of mental Olympics that makes anything that you sit on it just it it cannot invalid. it it invalidates it and and people like Clarence Thomas they like to call themselves originalists which mean that they believe they are constitutional purists and that the only way to interpret the Constitution is to go back in time and try to ascertain the meaning of the founders who wrote the document and then apply the law in the spirit and in the context of how the founders intended for it to be applied. Clarence couldn't mean that. Clarence couldn't but that's mean what that. I'm saying. So Clarence, if we did that, your ass would not be sitting in the seat you were sitting in. If we, if we used original interpretation, original. And interpretation. Amy can't be one. Is Amy one too? Amy couldn't she be one She is. Either. She, she is. They are, they she are all, she would not be sitting in the seat. That, that is why I'm saying it is so intellectually dishonest to pretend that this is a righteous way to do constitutional interpretation, especially when it's being done by women and Negroes, because it's like newsflash. <laughs> if we go by originalist intent. <laughs> Sidebar, this is making me think about, I feel like the intersection between, the overlap between these people, the originalists, and the people who interpret the Bible literally, I feel like we've got this circle, right? Like, this is, I feel like these are the same people who are using both of these documents and texts in wildly inappropriate ways, and probably for the same aims. Anyway. Yes, and when you and when you look at people like Clarence Thomas and like Amy Coney Barrett, and you say, "Hey, well, you know, if we do that, what does that do to you?" And they just kind of completely skip over that. That is reaffirmation of how problematic it is. And I will say one of the favorite parts of this whole exercise for me was reading the dissent by Justice Sonia Sotomayor uh, that was joined by Justice Katanji Brown Jackson and Justice Elena Kagan. And one of the things she says is, we really finna sit here and pretend like our constitution was colorblind. And we really finna pretend like there's no race consciousness in our constitution because the whole reason we have a 14th amendment is because of race consciousness. In reconstruction, people looked around and said, oh crap, we have freed a whole class of people who are now literally being oppressed and subject to violence and subject to inequity in a different way. And we have to amend the constitution in order to protect those people to keep that from happening. That is not color blindness. That is not color blindness. And if you look at the original intent of the people who ratified that amendment, the original intent was to protect black former enslaved people. That is race consciousness. And the fact that they built a whole opinion on this pretend notion that there's no race consciousness in American politics and in the American constitution, it's crazy. It is crazy. I just, um, so at the conference, I spent a lot of time talking to people about the notion of Afro-pessimism and I'm still learning about Afro-pessimism, right? But one of the basic ideas that, one of the things I think is the basic idea is this notion of Black people having this like ontological depth or this depth that like, in origin in like it's always is right like that's how it always was and this just this sort of thing just makes me more pessimistic because I'm I just think about how we've built the entire society around anti-blackness and while, of course, there are other people now who are caught in the sauce in terms of 
indigenous people and you know them originally before us here but essentially this is like anti-blackness all on display and i just find it hard to keep moving on you know what i mean and not in a way of like doing anything um harmful but it's just like you see all of these things and not that i'm trying to say well what's the answer but i'm just like wow where do we go when this is what we this is this is what we have absolutely and i think that's a very fair point in this context because one of the things that this opinion does is it puts unrealistic expectations on people who are trying to figure out how we navigate in a system that has been built to shut us out. And if you are dealing with people who pretend like the system hasn't been built to shut you out, then every time you try to get in, they're going to look at you and, and again, gaslight you. And, and part of, part of what I, resent so much about this is that they're able to get away with it because they're using big words and they're citing court cases. And so many people can't distill down to the heart of the fact that when you look at it, this shit does not make any sense. Because one of the things that the court decided in its holding was that the reason why what Harvard was doing and UNC was doing was impermissible is because these affirmative action policies do not have an expiration date on them. So their position is, well, things are getting better. So these programs have to have an expiration date. And my question is, how can you put an expiration date on remediation if you ain't put no damn expiration date on racism? So one of the things the court said is- well, Okay, let me ask you this. How do you put an expiration date on remediation when you ain't never started? <laughs> okay. When do you, how, how, we got to start first to be able to- I'm sorry. But even if we just assume, because let's just let's just let's just give A for effort in this. Let's just assume that letting black people into college, evaluating them on racist GPAs and racist standardized test scores, That's and, the then, and then saddling them with student loan debt and then underpaying them and compare. Let's just assume that's an A for effort and that's a start. Okay. 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 Let's just let's just assume. Okay. Let's, let's, just, let's just assume that's a start. But again, how do we even talk about stopping it if you are starting with the proposition that we live in a society with a colorblind constitution? Because how are you going to stop the remediation if you don't even have an end date on the racism and you won't even acknowledge that it's happening? Yeah. The, the court said um, Gruder, which was Gruder versus Bollinger, which was a, a case that happened before this, that, that said eventually these programs need to be terminated be because we we shall overcome um <laughs> gruder added a provision that any race-based consideration eventually had to have a sunset or ending point gruder thus concluded with the following caution now mind you i just want to say gruder is from 2003 so this was 20 years ago okay it has been 25 years since justice powell first approved the use of race to further an interest in student body diversity we expect that 25 years from now the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further oh, the interest of truth years? today. Yes, oh, that is what they, that's that that's their point. That we are basically right there, and we have overcome oh. in the twenty years since two thousand three. Oh. We have overcome, and that is why we no longer need to consider race based, you know, issues in college admissions because. We are there. We have overcome. So we ignore the income gap, the racial wealth gap, the effectiveness of what a college education can do for certain populations of people. We ignore the fact that the home ownership rates are pretty much the same as they were <laughs> back when the Fair Housing Act. Like, we gonna ignore all of that and we are here. Yes. We are we are basically right here where Gruder versus Bollinger said we would be almost 25 years later. And That's the amazing. passage and the passage of time necessarily means the elimination of racism. You know, because time is passing, obviously racism is ending. Yeah. Racist obviously. people just die. They just get old and die. And 
as racism becomes more embedded in our systems and in our infrastructures and in our consciousness and in our ethos, uh, it, it of course affects us less, you know, because it's it's hiding well and it's hiding better. Obviously, that means we don't need to do anything about it, you know. Totally. So I, I want people to know that this is literally the logic that these folks are using to say that a college acknowledging that a student who is black and who has a 3.6 or a 3.5 in a world where they've been more likely to be criminalized and in a world where they've had to take a standardized test that has implicit and explicit bias against them might just so happen to be equally as qualified as another student with a 4.0 who doesn't have to go through all of those things. The court is saying because it has been 20 years since they said we could do that, those things are no longer issues. Well, I'm happy to know that, you know, we have kids, Amber. We have a lot of kids between us. I'm happy to know that racism hasn't been solved. That's amazing. I love mm -hmm. that for them. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, just, I just want people to know that these issues are not complex legal issues. This is just bull crap. Okay, because you don't have to be a, a legal scholar to know that between 2003 and 2023, the world did not become magically unracist. Like, you don't need a law degree to know that. Okay, you don't need a law degree to know that. Mm -mm. So, okay, Amber, um, not to take us away from this, but one related thing, one of my friends was sending me some information about Bloom and that it, and the thing that, the thing that I love about these sorts of people who are these, these conservative people who run these think tanks and have these organizations and do all, have all of this dark money operating in the shadows. The thing that I really love about them is they don't tire. They do not grow no. tired. No. And so the information that I got is now Bloom is like, you know what? We have won on the university scale on that level. And now we're setting our sights for corporate America. Because corporate That's America, exactly. you also sometimes want to try to look at things like race and we don't like that. So have you heard about or seen about other moves? Because they always doing something, Amber. Child, ain't nobody, ain't nobody busier than Edward Bloom, okay? So this opinion just came out um, a couple of months ago. And he has since then subsequently filed two suits. He, I don't know, have you heard of the Fearless Fund, which is a venture capital no. fund founded by uh, a woman named Arian Simone? She's in Atlanta, I don't want to say a black woman. Yes, I don't want to okay. say socialite, but she's very well connected socially, and she has a a background in finance, finance and tech. And when she found out that, and I want y'all to listen to this number of all the venture capital. Oh shit! Yeah, less than one half of one percent of it goes to ideas and businesses and ventures ran and owned by black women she founded a fund to target black women in the tech space to get them funding and that fund has been now sponsored by bank of america mastercard visa and last year they gave out 26 million dollars to black women he is suing the fearless fund on the basis that they are discriminating by only giving those funds to black women, because there is a provision um, in the government, in, in the federal law that says that you cannot discriminate against people in private contracting. Um, and he is using that provision to say that women who are turned away from this fund because they are not black are being discriminated against. He is I also- I mean, white women have it hard out here. Like, I just, just be very clear. Okay. Like, I mean, what you want them to do? Ignore that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, bless their heart. And he's also suing two huge M Law 100 law firms, two of the largest law firms in the United States. What is M Law? Uh, so it's basically like a ranking. The 100, M Law 100 is the 100 biggest law firms in the country that, okay. you know, are huge multi city multinational a lot of them have offices outside of the united states he's suing perkins coey 
and Morrison Forrester, which are two law firms that have something called diversity fellowships, you know, because black people and brown people are so overrepresented in the legal profession. <laughs> but Especially these, at those firms, I'm sure. I'm exactly. Sure exactly. So these two firms have created diversity fellowships, which allow students who uh, start there as first year students who intern and then you'll come back and intern again and then you will eventually get a job but the, what the fellowship does is it provides opportunity for them to get certain coaching in addition to that mentorship and they also get um, money because what a lot of people don't know is when you you don't take the bar exam until after you graduate from law school so you already have a law degree but you don't have a license and for a lot of people it's six or seven months before you find out whether you're licensed. So like for me, I graduated in May. I took the bar exam in July. I didn't find out that I passed until November. So that's like a six or seven month period. So people have to eat. And a lot of times people are not employed during that period. So what this fellowship does is for students who make it successfully through, they are paid money during that bar exam period that allows them to live and eat and have housing while they're waiting for their bar results. Um, he's suing those law firms for that program. Yeah. I don't know what to say. I just, again, I grow more pessimistic by the day. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. What I, what I hope and what my hope is, is that as we demystify this stuff, because I think a lot of people assume that this shit is complex. They assume that there must be some legal loophole that prevents colleges from considering race or that these people had some long drawn out valid basis for doing this. And I just, what I came on here today to say is actually, this is the most flimsy logic ever. It's the most flimsy reasoning. And my hope is that when people know that, like when people know that, oh, they saying that they can do this because the Constitution is colorblind. Well, I don't even have to be that smart to know that's not true. Or they saying that, you know, this is wrong because the racism that hasn't ended. Well, the racial programs to stop it have to end first. Well, that doesn't make any sense. And so my hope is that when people know that this flimsy ass logic is what's upholding this, that they feel like they can do something too. Cause this ain't this ain't rocket science. Literally. That just makes that makes me feel worse about all of it, Amber. That because that's even more insidious. Because well, in front of us, the emperor has no clothes. And it's like we know that this is not. We know that this stuff is not true. We know that the arguments are not valid. We know that the logic is flawed, but still we have to live under these dictates. And I just, what? Like I, yeah. that's the part for me. It's like, I, I wish it were a complex thing. <laughs> like I wish it were, cause then I could just blame it on that. But based on what you're telling me, y'all just playing in my face and I have to let you. That is literally what is happening. We are we are having our faces played in on so many levels. And I I am so I am so angry that we accept this. Like we we accept this as normal, that we accept this as a part of the price for having a political system like it's, it is it is crazy. I would almost just rather them say, we're going to do it this way because it's how we always done it and this how we want to do it. Because at least that, I don't have to like that, but it makes sense. You know what I'm saying? And it just it just infuriates me when people play on my intelligence. I, I, you know, and, and the farce of this democracy is to, y'all just got to, why we still call it that? Y'all still telling children that in these PragerU videos when they... <laughs> Have you seen those prayer you videos? Girl, I can't I can't make it through a whole one. But the same people who say that there's benefits to enslaved people from slavery are the same people who will look at you in your face and say to you that the 14th Amendment is colorblind. Like, stop. No, it is not. No, it is not. The same amendment that passed the same day we created the Freedmen's Bureau is not colorblind. It is not colorblind. Stop. 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 No. 
it's, it's totally not. And I think, yeah, we realize that it's not. And I, here's the, here's the only thing that I can take out of this is because when I hear some of these things, and I've heard other people saying this too, like if, if you, I'm going back to the, what's the name of the case, Amber? Give me, give me the whole government name of the case. Oh, students <laughs> for fair admissions. Yes. It's hard. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. See, that's why you should so, let me say it the first time. <laughs> so if I go back to that case specifically, um, if you paid attention, the faces of the case were oftentimes Asian Americans, right? So they got used as sort of the face of the case. And I think it can be easy for us to sort of point to the limits of solidarity and think to ourselves, how is it that we can be in solidarity, be in community with Asian Americans or more broadly with white women when these are the sorts of things that happen when they get pulled out and they volunteer as tribute to be the faces of these things. And I just wanna say that what is helping me not to do that or helping me not to want to feed into that is I think about Candace Owens, like honestly. And I'm like, Candace Owens is black and I can't have no solidarity with her. So, but I'm not throwing black people out as people that I can be in solidarity with. So in the same way, this is just like a cautionary thing for us not to be like, oh, we, you know, solidarity is not possible with other races or solidarity is not possible with white women. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> okay. But, uh, I just can't, I just don't want us to think that it's not possible because it is the same white supremacy and anti-blackness that prop them up, right? They're being used as pawns in a different way than we get used as pawns, but they're pawns in, in all of this. And so I, I just want us to be careful or more thoughtful about that. And I'm speaking to myself. I, no, I agree. And I also think that what that, what that whole, the whole thing that you just brought up reminds us is that this system ain't loyal to anybody. And it will None of you hoes. It will use it will use anything. It will it will exploit anything. And then when when they get it, when they exploit it, when they turn it into something that is dirty and and unpure and what it what it, what it wasn't meant to be, then they say, Oh, well, we have to throw the thing away. Instead of saying, well, well, we need to stop doing the shit we doing, right? Because affirmative action never had anything to do with deciding that Asian people have no courage or no kindness or right. no capacity to get along with other people. Affirmative action never had anything to do with that. But we will get in in, in this American capitalist system when we trying to build colleges to attract billions of dollars in funding and endowments and we... These schools don't have clean hands. I just want to be clear about that. Like they don't they don't have clear hands at all. And so the fact that they are really out here trying to create we are the world posters and we are the world puzzles so they can go out here and get money and get funding. That has nothing to do with the fact that one day a long time ago, somebody said, hey, if we are not intentional and affirmative about bringing people to the table who were excluded, they ain't never going to be brought to the table. Because that's all affirmative action was. Yep. And we see what it has turned into. Yes. Yes. And the only other place where I'm able to get hope right now, so I'm, I'm able to get some modicum of hope from maybe solidarity, but I'm also able to get some kind of hope for some of the things that I think that, I can't believe I'm saying this, some of the things that some white people loosely are doing to like, make things better or, and I'm thinking about like at my own university. So in the state of Texas, and I can't remember what bill it was like seven, I don't know, whatever the number was. Anyway, all offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion at colleges and universities have been banned. 17, so, right? Oh, okay. 17. So all of those DEI offices are banned. And in some cases, the people who work there might have been deployed to other areas of the university. But in places where they were like, okay, y'all said we're banning DEI offices. We're gonna start calling ours an office of belonging. 
right? Like, let's figure out, just give it, give this shit a new name. And then we'll be able to check your box when you come around here looking. Do y'all have an office of DEI? I know we don't. We have an office of belonging. And so I think in the same way that they don't get tired and they're very creative, we have to also stay up and don't get tired and become very creative and think about how do we work outside the will of what they intend? And thinking about that is the only thing that is making it for me right now. Truth, same, same. And I, I just think that we need to do what our grandmothers and, and grandfathers used to say. We we gotta we gotta not get weary in our well doing because they if if can't stop won't stop wasn't a person is it look, would look. okay because he lost for ten years straight okay they litigated Fisher versus University of Texas for ten years one and two and he lost can't stop won't stop and they not gonna stop so we can't stop either and that that's just the bottom line. We can't stop. Yeah. And I mean, we can't stop. But Edward Bloom is not being beat up on all sides and still being told to don't stop. <laughs> well, you got a good point. You got a good point. There. So we being told don't stop. But we also get beat up on all sides. But well, that's, now, that's black just, life. Let me right? just say this, though. I want y'all to Google when y'all get a chance. Uh -oh. I want y'all to Google Abby Fisher and Edward Bloom. Please don't Google No, listen, Abby. listen. God's displeasure is all over there. Oh, yes. Baby, <laughs> let me tell you, that right don't nothing age you like some racism. Cause I don't I don't think Abby 35. Baby, Abby look like everything she been out here going through. Okay. <laughs> Edward Bloom look like everything he done ever went through. And I don't even know if people with millions of dollars go through stuff. I don't know. Ask Erica. But all I'm saying is. God is not pleased. Mm, not, with, they, not with and, them faces. And they aging like God is not pleased. So. <laughs> so Amber, thank you for taking it easy on us. Um, for, like I said, as my new friend Kai Andrew says in his show, making it plain for us. And for keeping it simple, not taking us through all the 15 pages that you didn't took me through as you didn't sent me the script for the show. I am going to hope and pray that you don't have homework for us today, though, because you didn't already took us to school, Amber. Baby, let me what, tell you what's something. Going on? I'm 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 the teacher. I'm my mama. Y'all, my mama retired September 30th from teaching. I'm a, I'm not I'm not doing nothing. OK, so I'm not giving no homework because I don't want to grade no homework. OK. <laughs> So I'm not giving no homework. I done read 257 pages of a legal. I ain't read this much legal writing since law school. Ain't no homework. OK, I'm the teacher that's rolling the TV in. we having video day next week. So y'all <laughs> good. OK, we having video day. We good. And the thing is, all the brokers are old enough to know what you're talking about. Because you know, <laughs> Some people will be like, what is she talking about? Rolling the TV in. But I think the people who listen to this show know exactly what you're talking yes, about. Yes, we, we have yeah. a video day. Oh, that's amazing. I love I love that for us, Amber. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, y'all, I mean, to me, it can seem like we like in this parallel universe where people keep telling us about the post-racial society <laughs> that we're living in right now, right? And these attempts to make us seem like we can't believe our own eyes or what we're experiencing. And that's like all a part of the nasty trick. And in all the ways that we can, it's important that we never out allow our history, the history of our ancestors to be lost despite all the attempts that are going on to do that, to erase, to roll back and to destroy things, the memories and the rights that really are ours. And so liberation is taking back everything the devil stole from us. Amber, what's the song? Don't you, ain't that a song? I went to the enemy's camp. And oh, I nice. took back what he stole from me. I <laughs> took back what he stole from me. Hallelujah. Don't get me started. Well, y'all, I, I think that's the message. We need to take back what God stole. So thanks for tuning in. And we look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of Brokish. All right, good people. Thanks for listening to Brokish. For more episodes, visit us at Brokish.com or subscribe and Brokish will get direct deposited into your favorite podcast app on the 1st and 15th.
Share Brokish with your friends and join the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Music for Brokish is Come Get Some by Blank and Kit. Until next time, goodbye and good luck. They say when you wear Black Power Media gear, you can accomplish anything. You play any and every position. Coaching, to kicking, to receiving, to running and juking. And, oh, my goodness. Let's see that again in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're going to have a lot of haters coming at you. But what you got to do is you got to shake them off. Shake them off and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra, for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you're talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Power yourself today. Yeah.